as George said, in spirit and truth. Who's <laughs> 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 George? <laughs> well, I didn't want you to feel that. <laughs> All right, thank you, Lord. Listen, if you don't mind, take your Bible, open up to the book of Matthew. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 21 this morning, and I'm sure that you're aware of the fact that we are now uh, in the, the Holy Week, so to speak, and um, this particular Sunday we mark the triumphal entry of Jesus in Jerusalem, and I know with all the funky weather that we have had recently, and can you imagine, we had snow at the house yesterday, and uh, yet here we are on Resurrection Memorial uh, month. We're almost there. One more week. And uh, that's what we're doing next week at Kusawati. We are going to celebrate the memorial of the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. And I hope that if you're not attending somewhere that you'll um, take the time to go there and meet with us. Um, just remember this. When you go to the gate at Kusawati, because they all you know, live behind the gate, make, su make sure that you tell the gatekeeper, hey listen, we're here to go to the um, Resurrection service of Mountain Life Baptist Church, and they'll let you right in. So you'll have to stop and tell the gatekeeper to let you in. Oh, but just be sure to do that. Up against the building, not for the yeah, yeah. because that's for guests and, and uh, for the um, excuse me, owners uh, there. So yeah. So if you guests. so if you go to the hoity toity side, they'll stop <laughs> you. <laughs> My sister. And then you'll. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They'll block you. You can't come in here. Right. <laughs> Pastor, I also want to make a note too. On the map, it says. It Villa Circle. Don't go around the circle unless you're really confident you can stay on a narrow road. Okay. <laughs> because it, it's a bad road going around the circle. Okay. So, and one thing, Creekside turns into another road out of turn, so it's, it's all the same road. Just stay on that road when you turn left. So does anybody else have a, a testimony about Pusa <laughs> 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 It's a big bitch. Well, listen, this. While we're testifying, anybody want to just share something that the Lord's just blessed your heart with? I'm just thinking about uh, that last song we sang and what a blessing Amen. and how we'd rather have Jesus than anything. Anybody want to give a quick testimony of what the Lord's maybe doing in your life or maybe when you were saved? Or... Yes, sir. When I, when I trusted the Lord, I, I had no idea what the Bible said about anything. I just believed there was a God and his name was Jesus and he died for my sins. And we get into the Word of God and just know all the riches of it. And what more than just salvation, you have your second reconciliation, your justification. There's so many things that come with that. And assurance that I know that I know my faith is not in me anymore because it was before. It's in only His death came for mine. And that's good news. Man, that is good news. news. When we entrust ourselves to Him, all that accomplishes. Amen. Anyone else? Well, it's been good to you in a special way you want to share it. You know what's going to happen if you don't ever preach. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I just want to thank you how glad I am to see Fred and Kathy at City Seahawks. Yeah, good to have you. I told Trish it's hard to recognize Jeff without glasses of some kind. I'm so used to him looking over those glasses at me. And then it's good to have Ms. Uh, Davenport here with us tonight or today. Thank you. I've enjoyed to see you. Very Amen. Much. Good. Good. I was going to introduce Debbie. Oh, okay. Yeah. They, they know it. One of our neighbors. Lives right down the street. Welcome. So good to have you. Thank you. Okay, so if you're not going to say anything, turn and look with me at Matthew chapter 21. Um, we're going to really look at the first 11 verses, 9 specifically, but we'll go all the way through verse number 11 as far as our reading. Then I'm going to come back. I want to talk to you about marching to the beat of a different drum. And um, again, today is Palm Sunday, and so it's a day uh, that we mark out the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. And when we mark this event, the text reveals that on the original triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, a parade had begun to form. I mean, people had begun to gather around, and a parade route had been established. And they were there with the intention of ushering Jesus in as ultimately their long-anticipated king 
of Israel, the one who would deliver them from the bondage of having uh, the Roman rule over them. If we looked over into Luke chapter 19, verse number 38, the word of God says, Blessed is he that cometh, or blessed is the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So we knew in their mind, they thought Jesus was coming into Jerusalem to establish God's kingdom on the earth through the nation of Israel at that time. But you and I now know that the parade actually had a different objective in the heart of God. God's plan was not to establish the kingdom at that moment, but rather after the humiliation of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, after his triumphal uh, resurrection from the grave, after his ascension into heaven, one day, we know, because we're studying through Revelation normally, if you come on uh, Sunday, once we get past the Easter celebration, we're back in the book of Revelation. We know that Jesus is coming back to the earth. He will establish his earthly kingdom, millennial kingdom, thousand year reign on the earth, and we'll be a part of that. So we know that's going to happen. And the people in Jerusalem thought that was going to happen in their day, but they were wrong because Jesus had to first come and make the sacrifice that was necessary for mankind to be saved, right? And so while the parade route had formed, and while they were celebrating, and, and they were noisy, uh, being noisy in the street, and proclaiming Hosanna, you know, and all those things God saves, uh, they were very excited. Um, and while that was the case, the reality was Jesus was actually on a death march. He was headed to the cross of Calvary. And as John chapter 10 and verse 11 says, he was going to lay down his life for his sheep. And we can all say hallelujah to that, right? Amen. And amen. Okay? So as we look at this text of scripture, Jesus knew what was coming. He knew that he was going to die on the cross of Calvary. He knew that it was going to be a painful, agonizing, uh, suffering death that he was going to experience. And yet, he marched faithfully on, marching to the beat of a different drum. And when I think about Jesus marching, marching to the beat of a different drum, I, I begin to think about what was the cadence like? What was the course like for Jesus? And I realized, and this is where the title came from, Jesus was not marching to the heartbeat of the national pride of Israel. Jesus was not even marching to the heartbeat of the world around him. Jesus was marching to the heartbeat of his heavenly father. He was going to the cross of Calvary. He was going to carry out his father's will. And it was a predetermined route for his life. And with that predetermined route came a sense of purpose and a sense of destiny that was going to change a mankind for all of eternity. Now, as we look here, look with me at verse number one. We'll read through this, and then we'll come back, and we'll take it apart. Beginning in verse one, the word of God says this. When they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. So God had pre uh, established some things. He had put some things in place, and Jesus just tells them, go ask, tell them the, um, that I have need of them, the Lord hath need of them, and they'll give them. And all this was done, notice this, I have it underlined, I have it highlighted in my Bible, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, in other words, all of this is according to the will of his heavenly Father. It's already recorded in the Old Testament. Zechariah 9 9 is where that comes from. Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and the colt the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. And they brought the ass and the colt and put, them, uh, put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a great multitude, here's where the parade route begins to reveal itself. A great multitude spread their garments in the way. They were laying them out uh, before the Savior who was about to enter into Jerusalem. Others cut down branches, or palm branches we know is what they were, and those are a symbol of victory. 
from the trees, and they strewed them in the way. And the multitude that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And that word Hosanna means, oh, say, oh, say. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of, Nazareth, of Galilee. Amen. And the Lord had a blessing to the reading of his word. Now, as we take this uh, section of scripture apart, I want to just kind of, you know how I like to teach the Bible. I like to not only reveal what exactly it's saying, but I always like to approach God's holy word as if it is a true love letter to us, God speaking to our life. So not only do I want to show you the characteristics of Jesus' life as he marched to the heartbeat of his heavenly father, I would like to suggest that you can apply these principles to your life as well. And God does have a heartbeat for every single life in this room. God has a purpose for your life and for my life. God has a, a destination, a destiny, if you will, for your life as well as my life. And it's as unique as each and every one of us are. So God being God, God being infinite as he is, can look into all of our lives and we can apply Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10 where it says we are his workmanship, right? Created in Christ Jesus unto good works that we before are that before were ordained that we should walk therein. And so every believer has a predetermined plan that God has for their life. So when I look at this, number one in your outline, marching to the heartbeat of God sets us on a predetermined route. That's verse number four and verse number five. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. And so it, it's obvious that since it was already in Scripture in the Old Testament, it was a plan that God had already laid out. He had established this route, and it was the way that Jesus must, needs, go. Because he was marching to God's army, right? And you say, well, you know, is that enough scriptural evidence to say so, make such a strong statement that it was a predetermined route? Well, there's so many other scriptures that say the same thing or indicate the same exact thing. I would turn your attention to Acts chapter 2 and verse number 22 if you look there. And listen to what Peter says. Because this is true of Jesus' whole life. If Peter says this in verse number 22 of Acts 2. He says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So he's basically talking about the life of Jesus, and he's saying, look, all the miraculous stuff that's swir swirling around Jesus Christ, it's all because God is working in and through him in his life. And the reason for that is because he's marching the path that God had for him, right? And, and I want you to know that when you and I walk in the center of God's will for our life, then we have the same experience in our life. God is working all things to our good, to those that love God, the called according to his purpose, Romans 8 and verse number 28. So he's moving in the midst. Now look at verse uh, 23. Him, speaking of Jesus, being delivered by the what? Determined counsel and this is the word we're afraid of as Baptists, foreknowledge of God. This was all according to God's plan, what he knew he wanted to accomplish, what he was going to accomplish. He then says, ye have taken. So God in his sovereignty has lined all of this up for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in his sovereignty, he allows wicked men to take his son in order to fulfill what his plan was for his life. Now, while Jesus didn't deserve it, the reality was 
it was necessary for our salvation. Amen? Amen. And so God was sovereignly taking his, his uh, sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God, down this predetermined path. He allowed wicked men to then take him, in verse 23, and crucify him and to slay him. Look at verse 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. That's what we'll celebrate Amen. next Sunday, right? Okay. New life and new life in Christ. Because it was not, and this is a hallelujah verse, and you can go ahead and shout if you want, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. In other words, it's not possible that death could hold the Son of God. And we ought to say hallelujah, right? Because if it couldn't hold him, those who follow him, they can't hold us either. And when we follow Jesus, we simply march into and out of the grave in our resurrected state, right? We, I mean, we'll be resurrected one day in our um, doc telling you a little bit about that in Sunday school. Now, when I look at Jesus and his life, and I think about his ministry and his work and all that was done, I would, let, I would remind you that Jesus came to do his Father's will. Right. Now, I think this is important for us. That should be our desire. To do the Father's will. It's no longer, we are purchased possessions. It's no longer about our will and our wants and our desires. What does God want to do through my life? How can God get glory from the way I live, how I talk, all of those, how I witness? That should be the desire of our heart, just like it was for Jesus. But not only did Jesus come to do the Father's will, you need to understand that he also came to fulfill his father's word. Amen. Amen. Now, that's good news because we base our whole life and our eternity on the promises of God's word. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus was fulfilling the word. And like I said, it was Zechariah 9 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation. He is lowly and riding upon an ass, upon the colt, the foal of an ass. And I don't know about you, but when I read that passage of Scripture, and since I've studied God's Word, and you know as well as I do, you've studied it, you've heard preaching, you know that Jesus is more than a baby, you know that He is the risen Lord of glory, you know He's on the throne of heaven, right? You know He's coming back again one day with all power and authority to judge wicked humanity. You know all of that, amen? I mean, you know all of that. So it seems a little inappropriate that he would come in on a donkey. It just, he should be on a noble steed. I mean, he ought to be, he ought to be coming in with great pomp and circumstance into Jerusalem, wouldn't you think? Amen. And, and listen, if he'd been marching to the world's heartbeat, if he had been listening to the people of Israel, he might want to come in that way, but he wasn't marching to those cadences. He was marching to the heartbeat of his heavenly father. We know that he could have come in on clouds, right? You remember David um, in Psalm 18, I think it is, David was crying out to God, and he said, oh, I called upon the Lord, I cried unto God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and he said, my cry came unto him. And then you go down a few verses, in verse number 10 and it said he rode upon a cherub I mean he rode upon a mighty angel is what that says and he did fly yea he did fly upon the wings of the wind that's the way I would think Jesus would enter Jerusalem Amen. if he was coming the way we thought he should come if he was coming the way Israel thought her king should come in great glory and pomp and stance and putting down the armies, but that was not the heartbeat of God. Think about it. If Jesus had come that way and not gone to, gone to the cross of Calvary, there was no sacrifice sufficient to deal with your sin and with my sin. And that was our Heavenly Father's heartbeat, that Jesus would come and deal with with our sin. We know that Jesus himself said, he said it unto Peter, he said, look, I could have called 12 legions of angels. My father could have dispensed them down and could have rescued the, me from this cross. But he says in the book of Matthew, in chapter, verse number 51 of, of chapter 26, mm -hmm. but then how shall the scriptures be fulfilled? Mm -hmm. 
I'm here to fulfill what my father has said would take place. I'm marching to my father's divine plan and his heartbeat, which is to take me all the way to the cross of Calvary. So through the cross, I might deliver you from your sin. Mm -hmm. I mean, what? A great Savior, right? It is the heartbeat of God that our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, would come in poverty so that we might be rich. Amen? He came in humility that we might enjoy the supreme status of being called the sons of God. He came to deliver the captives who were held in bondage to their sin, not to slay enemies. He came in humiliation so that he might secure eternal glory for you and I. Amen. And I what a Savior. Amen. And that was the drumbeat that Jesus marched to. And so what does that mean to you and I today? It means that if you are in God's parade, if you are saved, you need to get close to God. And you need to stay close to God, so close that you can hear his heartbeat for your life. Amen. That's what you need to be doing. Christians, we aren't here for earthly pomp. We aren't here for earthly circumstance. We aren't here for earthly riches. We are here to honor and glorify God. What's the chief end of man? It's to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, right? Amen. I mean, that's one of the first things you learn in a catechism. That's, that's really the purpose of mankind, to glorify God and, and to march to that heartbeat is to glorify God. And let me add this, that though Jesus was destitute of earthly pomp, he was inundated with supernatural, spiritual power. Amen? Amen. And, and listen, when I see their garments on the animals and on the streets, I kind of see the picture. How does that apply to us? We take all of our garments and we lay them at the feet of Jesus. In other words, we take everything that we think is ours and out of glory and, and belongs to us. And we say, no, no, God, they belong to you. I want to I want to glorify you in everything. Amen. Take it all. Take it all. And when I see them laying them before them, they're thinking he's going to be their deliverer. He's going to be their king. And they're saying, hey, we're loyal. You have all of our allegiance. And we should be doing the exact same thing in our life as well. And then they put these palm branches down, which in that day was a token of liberty, victory. It was a token of joy. They, they were celebrating the deliverer was coming, and that's the same way that we should see Jesus as well. Our Amen. spiritual deliverer. And as we fix our gaze and our determination in life on doing the will of our Father, God will meet all our needs. Amen? Amen. He will take care of us as we walk with him. We are on that route that brings him honor and glory. Listen, one of the greatest things in life that we can do is to honor God. Amen. Isn't that what you want to do? Yeah. Is, is it what you want to do? Mm -hmm. I got a few more. Yeah. Is it what you want to do? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Listen, if you don't want to glorify God, you are in the wrong parade. <laughs> you are just, just well going out of here and going down to the field to play ball today. My, our desire is to glorify God just like Jesus did. And when we walk in obedience to the heartbeat of God, that's exactly what's happening. The second thing I want to show you this morning, verse 8 and 9, marching to the beat of God's heart means you never, ever march alone. Do you ever feel alone in life? Sure we do, right? But a lot of times the reason we feel that way is because we have built our lives on the world's support systems. The world's beams, if you will. And so we're looking to the world for our encouragement, for our strength, for, for renewal each day. And, and so anytime that underpinning is shifting or moving or taken away, we feel like we're all alone. But I'm here to tell you, if you're a child of God, if you get your focus right, if you're living for him day in and day out, all areas of your life, you are never alone. The Word of God teaches us that. I mean, just let me just make a couple of notations here in the life of Jesus. It says in verse number 8 and 9, a very great multitude spread their garments. And so the truth is, when you and I march to the heartbeat of God, the world may not like us, but God sure is tickled Amen. about it. Amen? Amen? And so notice in Jesus' life, I'm just going to make a couple of notations that aren't really here in the text. 
but I think they come from other sections of scripture that kind of indicate to us that Jesus never marched alone. First of all, we know according to John chapter 8, verse number 28, verse number 29, that the Father was always with Jesus. Did you know that? Uh, watch this. He says, Jesus said unto them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Now watch this, verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Do you want to always feel like you're never alone? Then walk in obedience to God. Jesus, or Jesus was never alone because he was always doing the Father's will. And so the Father was always right there operating in and through his life. And he spoke these words. Uh, as he spoke those words, it says, many believed on him. He said, well, Pastor, I know Psalm 22. And I've heard so many sermons where Jesus on the cross, he was forsaken by his heavenly Father. After all, he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, being interpreted, my God. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he said that on the cross of Calvary. So, Pastor, how can you say Jesus was never left alone? Because I read the whole psalm. Mm. Psalm 22 isn't a psalm of defeat. It's a psalm of victory. Did you know that? Amen. You read the whole psalm in verse 24. It says, For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. God didn't turn his back on Jesus on the cross of Calvary, Jesus was fulfilling his heavenly Father's mission. Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. Jesus was not alone on the cross. He was simply quoting a psalm, and he died, or he ran out of physical energy and breath before he could finish the psalm. And if he had finished the psalm, then he would have, you would have heard those things. Yes, my father's not going to leave me. He's not going to forsake me here. Did you know, and I know you're all smart, so you know this. Did you know Psalm 23 comes right after Psalm 22? <laughs> See, I knew you were smart. And the Psalm 23, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Thou art with me. That God never leaves his children alone. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Well, the second thing I would mention is not only did the Father continue to minister to Jesus, notice in John 19 that all those who loved him were still there in his hour of need. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, hallelujah, right? Thank God for mamas, right? Amen. And his mother's sister, thank God for our aunts, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Uh, thank God for ladies, I guess. <laughs> when Jesus, therefore, saith his mother, the disciples or saw his mother and the disciples standing by. The idea is they were all there. Jesus was not alone, even though it would have felt like on the, I'm sure on the cross and the agony of that moment and the darkness of that moment, it, it would have been easy to feel like he was all by himself. And yet there was his mother and his aunt and other ladies and disciples all gathered around them. One of the beautiful things God has done for you as a born again believer is he's given you a church family Amen. who will walk through difficulties with you, Amen. who will love you through, carry you through if necessary minister to you in your hour of need and not only that how about the angels i mean they were near weren't they i mean the word of god tells us that they were assembled man they they were i, I get the idea they were straining to be released saying come on let us go Let, let's go defeat the devil let's go let's get him off that cross let's let's deal with this they would have done it at the slightest beckoning of jesus but jesus did not call them forth because he is marching to his father's heartbeat. My point is, the angels were close by, and at the, just the slightest breath, they would have come and delivered him. But Amen. that wasn't God's will. And then last of all, and I think I'm out of time. I, might, I can't see that clock back there very well. It's 12 to 11.47. Oh, man, I got lots of time. 
So I keep seeing the second hand, I think it's 12. Okay, so just in case, God had the rocks lying around. Yeah, you ever thought about that? If somehow, if somehow you could distract the Heavenly Father from his faithfulness to his beloved son, which you can't, but if you could, just say you could, and if you could quiet the uh, tongues of all the redeemed uh, before Jesus, if you could restrain the praise of the heavenly hosts of devoted angels, then you better watch out. You better not be standing near a tall building or near a mountain because the rocks are going to cry out. Amen? Doesn't the word of God tell us that? Uh, it's, listen to this. It says this. And when he was come nigh, he says in Luke 19, when he was come nigh, even nigh, now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God and with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. So there's a clamor, you know, rising up. Oh, blessed be Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna, right? Verse 38, saying, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, grace our glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among them, the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke your disciples. Stop them from that. That's not right. You're, you're, not, you're not Messiah. They shouldn't be praising you. Well, he was, and they should have been, right? Yeah. Anyway, it goes on to verse 40 and says this. And he answered and he said unto them, Well, I tell you that if these hold their peace, the stones will immediately cry out. So if you could shut up the angels and the disciples from testifying about Jesus, then the rocks will cry out. You say, well, pastor, did that ever happen? I think it did. I think it did. Go with me to Matthew chapter 27. And look at this with me. Just a few verses later, chapters later. Listen to this. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. He died. He died, Right? And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, from God to man. Hallelujah, right? And listen to this. And the earth did quake. Now, when there's an earthquake, is it quiet? No, there's a rumbling, man. There's a rumbling. And then it says, and the rocks rent. They broke in half. I mean, I've broken a few rocks in my lifetime. I mean, they make a lot of noise, right? You take a sledgehammer, and it's like, wham! Wham! And then when they finally crack, it's like, <laughs> it's a yeah. noisy process. So think about what's going on. The darkness had settled in. The eerie silence had developed as the, as the disciples stood there and they saw Jesus' death on the cross and, and they were, their tongues were, were, they were silent in, 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 in trepidation of what was going on. And, and there hangs the lifeless body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, on the cross of Calvary, and he was crucified by wicked hands, and, and what a tragedy, and, and if they could do it to him, what would they do to us? We better be quiet, right? The, the, scene, the scene had become unspeakable. God in flesh dying on the cross of Calvary in such a humiliating way. It was silence and darkness fear and intrepidation and what happened the Bible makes it very clear that the rocks thundered to life the earth shook and the rocks began to break you know what they were doing in that hour no one could speak in the travesty of the hour and so God allowed the rocks to declare it's him oh, it's yeah. the son of God it's the Lord of glory it is our creator and we want to testify of who he is Amen. and so there you have it the rocks crying out you said but pastor what does that mean to us what it means to you what it means to me is that if you march to the heartbeat of God in your life, you never, ever march alone. Amen. The Word of God says this in the book of Hebrews, I will never, I will never leave thee. I will never, y'all thought I forgot the rest. I'm just doing that bread business. I will never leave thee, y'all. I will never leave y'all nor forsake y'all, right? And then he goes on to say, 
so that you are that so that we may boldly say the Lord he's my helper I will not fear for what men shall do unto me and it's in persecution that we feel the most loneliness in our life and here that verse is saying don't you worry about it you suffer for Jesus and he's with you Amen. all the way through Amen. you never march alone number three and this is found in verse number five in my opinion and then in verse number 10 and 11, where he quotes uh, that scripture out of Zechariah 9, 9. And then in verse number 10, and when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Thy king cometh is the focus here. And the statement still should inspire a sense of urgency in our lives. It should inspire a sense of passion. And so when, number three is when you march to the heartbeat of God, you are, all, you are involved in a process that has eternal purpose. You have a divine destiny, if you will, a sense of destiny. God is doing something through you for his own glory. And so we should always be aware of that when we're walking obedient to God and the world doesn't understand and maybe our spouse doesn't understand and our boss doesn't get it and the world mocks us and all of those things that go on. We should not worry about that because we have a purpose in our life and we have a destiny where we are headed for God's glory and for our benefit. Amen. Amen. I mean, it's just good news. And Jesus here was entering into Jerusalem with his full focus on the will of his heavenly father. He was passionately, I think, passionately, passionately pursuing the cross that had been given to him. Do we? Do we? Jesus said, you know, so if you're not willing to take up your cross and follow me, you're not, you're not worthy of me. And Jesus gave us the example. He bore his cross all the way passionately. He embraced the sacrificial death that would alone atone, atone for the sins of mankind. And he was, anti I believe, he was anticipating the resurrection which was about to take place. Remember he says in John 10 and verse 17 and 18, no one takes my life, I lay it down. And if I lay it down, resurrection Sunday's coming. Amen. I will take it up again. Jesus made the payment in full in order to secure our future and in order to fulfill the plan of the Heavenly Father for his honor and for his glory. He was on a mission. He was on a divine mission. And he was marching to the heartbeat of his Heavenly Father. So when I think about this, I would say this to you, because I don't know that the world always gets this, but here's the idea. I think I put an A under number three in your outline. He was not marching to defeat. The cross was not defeat. The cross had a purpose, and that purpose was to bear our burden for us, to experience the wrath of God in our place so that we wouldn't have to experience it. He was on a mission. He had destiny to fulfill, and that destiny was to be victorious over sin and its penalty. Amen? Amen. And listen, no one who walks with God will ever be overcome by the enemy very long. You can just count on it because we are not marching to defeat. We are marching as overcomers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be in your outline. Jesus marched with a purpose. And when we march to God's heartbeat, we are marching with a purpose. Amen. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Listen, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Amen. Listen to me, my friend. When you entrust your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and walk with him, you are walking to a destination. God, not only do we get to go to heaven, but we get to experience God for all of eternity. Jesus said, I am coming to get you, and I'm going to take you home with me. I mean, that's going to be worth it, right? It's going to be worth it all in the very end. Jesus said in John 14, verse number 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No man comes to the Father but by me. And Paul says, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Listen, mission accomplished. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that good news? <laughs> what great news in the gospel of Jesus Christ. An eternal home as we follow the author and the finisher of our faith, Amen. who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. A clear-cut destiny. The very throne of heaven in the presence of the very God himself. And what a privilege for us to have that same destiny. Amen. To be able to be drawn into the very presence of the eternal God and before his throne and as Ephesians 4, 13 says, being in the full measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Yeah. And all as all the trumpets blaze forth uh, triumphantly, we will hear from the Heavenly Father, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Yeah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. What a parade. So let me ask you a question as we close out today. As we close out. Who sets the cadence of your life? Where's the drumbeat coming from? Is it coming from the world? Is it coming from your friends at school or on the job? I'm going to tell you, it shouldn't come from anywhere but from the heart of God. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only do we get to go to heaven one day, but one of the promises of Jesus, I can't, I, he says, I came to give you life. And to give it to you more abundantly. I think God wants us to live a full life now. To his honor and to his glory. But it doesn't look like a stinking stuff out there. It just doesn't. And so when you understand that and surrender to him and begin to walk faithfully with him, you'll be amazed how the abundance of God will begin to flow in your life as you march to his heartbeat. And he just pours abundance into you. You say, well, um, I don't know if I'm on that parade route or not. I don't know if I'm in that parade or not. And I can change today, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> the Bible says this in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise, that is the judgment to come, or, or you know, the perdition. He says, but as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to us were. You know why? You know why he's waited so long? So you could get saved. He didn't want you to go to hell. He don't want you to spend eternity separated from him. He doesn't want you to experience the fullness of, of the wrath that your sins have incurred, which you've earned for yourself. He doesn't want that to happen, so he's long-suffering, and he's waiting, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. Where they come to the place and they go, oh, my soul, I see, I see, I I'm in trouble. I am guilty. I am a sinner, not only in, in, in what I do, but my very nature, the things I think, the things I desire. I am a wretched man. Oh, wretched man. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? And I'm going to tell you, Jesus will. Amen. Amen. Jesus will. And only, Amen. only, only he can. Amen. Only he can. So you come to that place where you say, oh, uh, man, I missed it. And then you turn to Jesus. In your mind, you're, you're thinking, you reconsider all that you've ever heard before. You go, oh, that's why. <laughs> that's why he had to die. That, that's why he had to be wrapped so tightly and go into the tomb to take away your <laughs> sin. That's why he had to be resurrected to show that he has power over the penalty of sin, which is the grave of death. And he has power to give new life to those who trust him. And he ascended to glory, showing us that one day that's, our, that's all of our destinies. Yeah. I mean, what a wonderful gospel. And repentance has stopped going in your mind and heart, the way of the world, the broad road that leads to destruction. And instead you reconsider and you turn to Jesus, and you entrust him. That means believing. You entrust him with your life and your destiny. Maybe you're here today and you've never done that. I want to encourage you, as the Spirit moves you, to respond.
to what he's calling you to. Maybe you're here and you need to join the church. Whatever it is, we'll let God speak to your heart as we have this invitation time. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity.